Hello and welcome to today's iCentd Connect meeting. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here all today. And uh, today we're going to be speaking about the relationship between climate change and neglected tropical diseases at a time when the WHO NTD roadmap is setting some um, exciting and ambitious targets for elimination for a large number of NTDs. Um, that this roadmap is also highlighting that we must take into account any effects of um, the climate and climate changes. And uh, can this um, help or will this hinder NTD elimination? Uh, we've also concurrently have a the Sustainable Development Goals, a fantastic framework that we can really harness across uh, disciplines and um, internationally and uh, across sectors to really highlight the role of health in achieving uh, not just improved health outcomes, but overall improve global development. So these are very interesting dynamics and questions that we will be looking at today. And uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Mark Booth. Uh, Dr. Mark Booth, hello. Uh, you're tuning in from the University of Newcastle and uh, you've got a, a very established um, body of work in parasitology, but also really focusing on multidisciplinary approaches to NTD research and control. Um, so we've uh, had the opportunity and the pleasure to meet and collaborate uh, on previous instances. And uh, you've worked across a huge number of institutions, very prominent institutions in the field of tropical diseases, uh, whether this be at the Swiss TPH, um, Cambridge University, previously at Durham University, um, and now in the Faculty of Medical Sciences at Newcastle University. So, uh, Mark, a very warm welcome to you. And it's our pleasure to have you on board for this um, second webinar as part of the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance series within ICENTD Connect. Um, we've got a great audience here today again to um, who have joined us and uh, looking forward to your talk. So I'll just take a few moments to say hello to Julia Halder, uh, to Onwuka Chigozi Divine, uh, Blessing Ziwa, Felix Okoth, hello, tuning in from around the world. Um, fantastic to have you here today. And without any further ado, Mark, I'll hand over to you for your presentation. And we look forward following that to having a nice Q&A and discussion with you. And to all our attendees, uh, please feel free to start posting any questions or comments, even any thoughts you may have about today's topic on climate and NTDs. Uh, on our chat function, either to your right of your screen or below us um, uh, if you're on a mobile device. Uh, thanks for coming on board and we'll see you in a few moments uh, for, for a Q&A and discussion. Thanks, Mark. Welcome to everyone to this seminar. Thanks to the GSA and the ISNTD for the invitation to talk to you. Uh, I have uh, spoken uh, about climate change and the schistosomiasis with the ISNTD before. Uh, this is going to be looking at some stories from the past and how they can inform what we might have to think about in the future. I will be talking mainly about schistosomiasis as it's a GSA seminar. So um, the title of this talk is Climate Change Helping or Hindering NTD Elimination. Uh, my background is in tropical parasitology. If you wish to get in touch after this seminar, there are a number of ways you can do that. Uh, and you can see at the bottom of here how you can get in touch by email. I have a blog. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, you can also look at what happens if you look at my um, background at, at Newcastle. So as Marianne has already said, the World Health Organization has published a roadmap. Uh, several versions of the roadmap exist, and the latest one is just being published and drafted. But what does it say about climate change? Well, the truth is very little. In fact, the words climate change only appear a couple of times in the document, and it states as written here, climate change alters the epidemiology of vector-borne diseases and the spread of NTDs. And then secondly, circumstances such as epidemics, political instability, migration, the consequences of climate change and antimicrobial resistance increase the complexity of the situation and will require additional action. Now, reading the roadmap does tell you that there are many ways in which we need to think about these additional actions, 
but not specifically about climate change. Should we mitigate or adapt, for example? So what I'm going to do in this uh, seminar is talk to you about some of the research I've been uh, working on in previous collaborations and then how we can think about whether we need to mitigate or adapt uh, in the future to ensure that targets as they are set are met if possible. Now first of all let me say something about climate change scenarios. Climate change sometimes means different things to different people but typically we're talking about decadal changes. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has published a number of different scenarios that reach into the future because it's very difficult to actually predict with confidence as you move further into the future. So we have to be aware that over time things may change. Even this year, within a year, it's very difficult really to predict what might happen in the future. And as we go further into the future, so we become more uncertain, as illustrated in this chart here. On the x-axis, we have years from 1980 to 2100. And on the y-axis, an estimate of fossil fuel emissions, sorry, emissions from fossil fuels. And we can see that over time, the confidence decreases. In other words, we could be up here, we could be looking at a scenario where there's a great deal of global warming or scenarios where there's less global warming and these are different pathways, representative concentration pathways. But in between are all these other possible pathways that we could take and notice that historically we know what happened in terms of emissions because we can look at the records. But in the future, as we move into decades ahead up to 2100, really we could be anywhere on this chart and it's very difficult to understand where we might be. The targets for NTD elimination sort of finish around about 2030, but even by 2030, we could be in a number of different scenarios. Why is this important for NTD elimination? It's because all neglected tropical diseases with climate sensitive life stages are going to be sensitive to climate change. They are sensitive to environmental parameters that shape the life cycle, natural history of those infections. So it's vitally important that we consider how climate change may or may not impact on the transmission of infection and therefore how we might need to mitigate or adapt against those changes that are likely or possible. So I'm going to start with some stories from the past. I've spent some time in the field undertaking collaborative research in different institutions with many collaborators from Africa in particular and the EU and the UK. And during those research projects there's often been an intervention against schistosomiasis, which is the, the parasite I've worked on mainly. And that intervention includes uh, giving medicine to people at, the, at a baseline point and then collecting information about reinfection some time later, maybe multiple time points later. At the same time, those interventions have collected other types of information, for example, environmental information. And when we come to do the analysis, we can examine the environmental information in relation to the reinfection patterns to try and understand whether or not the environment itself has helped or hindered that intervention. I've got three stories to tell, and they are examples not directly of climate change, but of where interventions have taken place at a time of a changing climate. And the intention is that we can take some of the observations made during those studies and inform how we might proceed if those events happen in the future. So the first one I will talk about is flooding that happened in a lake environment in Uganda. Then I'll be talking about drought in a river environment. And finally, an extreme storm in a river environment also in Kenya. These are three examples of the type of extreme weather events that have been associated with climate change in terms of an increasing frequency. They've always happened. And that means that these parasites that we're going to talk about have in some way adapted 
to these weather changes. But we need to project into the future. And the only way we can do that is by examining the data we have currently available. So they are useful for making future projections. The first story is going to take place in Uganda, in Masindi district. Those, some of you may be familiar with this area, the parish of Butiaba. During the early to mid 2000s, there was a number of collaborative studies in collaboration with the Ministry of Health in Uganda. And a lot of research was done to try and understand what happens to people who are vulnerable to schistosomiasis mansoni, schistosoma mansoni, in the area. Because it was a multidisciplinary study, we were able to collect information that helped with understanding immune responses, but also environmental change and social sciences and ecology. And there was a number of studies that looked at the spatial temporal variation in the intermediate host snails of the area. These are snails that support Schistosoma mansoni in the area. And there are two snails, Biomphalaria sedanica and Biomphalaria stanleyi. This map that you see on the left hand side is a map of sites that were sampled for these two snails. And you can see that there are circles or squares depending on the snail. So Biomphalaria sedanica is represented by the circles and Biomphalaria stanleyi is represented by the squares. These two snails occupy different ecological niches within this area. So Biomphalaria sedanica is typically found in deeper water and Biomphalaria stanleyi is typically found in shallow or marshy areas. And you can see their differential distribution on this map here by looking at the difference in the spacings of the circles and the squares. The size of the squares of the circles indicates the number of snails that were found during sampling. The triangles correspond to houses of the people living in this area. On the right hand side are some shots of the study area to show what it was like. Now, uh, between uh, 2000 and 2002, uh, Francis Kazibwe from the uh, Uganda Ministry of Health conducted a number of studies that collected snails and also environmental bioclimatic information from the area. And you can see two examples of the kind of data that were collected on this slide here. On the left hand side is a slide of rainfall collected at the sites of sampling by date and on the right hand side an estimate of this at the level of the lake. Now what's clear from looking at these two graphs is that rainfall is cyclical and there are two seasons rainy seasons a year roughly on average but that the lake level was during that period of time increasing considerably. Uh, there was some up and down movements in terms of the lake level but by November 2002 it was incredibly high. The rainfall pattern didn't change so something else was causing this increase in lake level and the flooding that's associated with it. For the purposes of this talk we'll just understand that the lake level was increasing we can speculate later on why it was increasing but what's important to note is this is an example of a flooding that happens in a lake environment and we can examine what happened to the uh, snails and also infection during this period as we go on. So what happened to the snails? Well, you can see from these two graphs over the same time period that the population of um, Stanley Eye, so this is the wrong way around, that should be uh, shallow water and deep water, um, crashed. There were cyclical up and down movements of the, uh, the snail population and Sedanica, on the other hand, went up and then also eventually crashed. So by, by November 2002, both snail populations had crashed. We can look at the data in a different format, and that is to examine the relationship between the lake level and the number of snails caught per site. And we have on the left hand side for Stanley Eye and on the right hand side for Sedanica. We can see that there are two quite distinct relationships here. When the lake level was fairly low, Stanley Eye were relatively abundant. When the lake level was high, Stanley Eye were 
very low in abundance. Sidanica, on the other hand, peaked in terms of abundance when the lake level was moderately high, but also then crashed when the lake level was high. So these are two differential responses of the snails to changes in the lake level. The reason for this is because they occupy different ecological niches. So a monotonic change in the lake level is likely intuitively to have a differential effect on the two species. And that's what we see displayed here. Now we know from experimental studies that the life history parameters of these two snails is acutely sensitive to water temperature. And as the lake level changes, so does the temperature of the water body itself. So what we see here from some experimental data conducted by Nikki McCreesh when she was a PhD student under my supervision, is that there is a clear parabolic relationship between water temperature, this is a water bath, an artificial water bath where snails have been subjected to constant temperature. There's a parabolic curve here which suggests that snails are not able to produce many eggs. These are graphs of egg production. They're not able to produce many eggs when the temperature is too cold or when the temperature is too hot. And there is an optimum temperature around about 22, 23 degrees when they produce the most eggs per snail per week. The number of eggs per mass per snail per week also peaks then, and the number of eggs per egg mass also peaks then. The reason for this is probably related to energy conservation and energy flows. What's likely to have been happening when these two snail populations crashed is that the water became too cold as it got so deep that at the bottom of the water body, the temperature was actually declining. And so snail fecundity, snail reproduction decreased massively. Snail mortality is inversely related to water temperature in an artificial bath situation. Again, peaking around about 20 to 23 degrees. If the temperature gets too hot, then the snails uh, will not live for so long. And if the temperature is too cold, the snails will not live for too long. So it's likely that the snails were living for less time due to cooling conditions at the bottom of the lake as the lake level was increasing. Now, what's about reinfection patterns? So there were a number of uh, interventions where Fraziquantel was given to the populations of a number of villages at the same period of time as these environmental changes were occurring. In one village, there were, before treatment, incredibly high levels of infection. Egg counts in the thousands, egg, eggs per gram of faeces, faecal egg counts were in their thousands, suggesting very high infection levels in all age groups, seven to 14 year olds, 15 to 30 year olds, and even 31 to 50 year olds, had uncharacteristically high levels of infection of schistosomiasis mansoni. However, that was in August 1998. By August 1999, the reinfection levels were very low. Typically, in a high transmission area, reinfection would occur rapidly. And this has been seen in other studies. And mathematical models also suggest that reinfection in a high transmission area can occur very rapidly. But we saw none of this in uh, this study area. And in fact, reinfection levels were comparatively low for several years up to including the final survey in March 2004. Similarly, in a neighbouring community, uh, similar observations that were started a little bit earlier in October 96, post-treatment, very little reinfection during that period, and even up to March 2004. So prolonged levels of low reinfection, despite very high pre-treatment infection levels. And again, in another uh, study area, just further up the coast, slightly further up the coast line, the shoreline, sorry, um, egg counts very high to begin with, one year later, very low reinfection levels. So on the one hand, one might argue that the textbooks maybe uh, are not so relevant because massive uh, levels of treatment, uh, sorry, massive uh, levels of infection before treatment did not necessarily correspond with rapid reinfection, even in a high transmission area. However, there was another community a few kilometers, kilometers further upstream where this pattern was not seen and rapid reinfection was observed over the same time period 
What separates all these communities is just a few kilometers. What's different about Bogoigo, perhaps, is that there are some different snail species, so Bionflaria pfeifferi is also present in that area. And some later work by Russell Stoddart and colleagues has shown that that area has a sheltered nature, and so there's higher snail abundances, and they're perhaps protected from some of the wave actions and other environmental aspects that affect the snails in these other areas. So what can we conclude from these studies? That snail ecology is strongly influenced by abiotic environmental factors over the short term, particularly around lake level changes. Those lake levels, la those lake level changes were substantially uh, associated with crashing of the snail populations in a certain time period. And that seemed to coincide with very low reinfection levels against expectations. So that suggests that in this case, a changing climate that, or the impact of a changing climate that we can think of as a proxy, flooding, did help almost eliminate Schistosmiasis mansoni in this area. The second uh, survey study I would like to talk about is one where there was drought, and that took place in Kenya. And it was, again, part of a very multidisciplinary survey with the Ministry of Health in uh, Kenya. And this included immunology and also environmental understanding and spatiotemporal analysis. Over the, a similar time period to the surveys in Uganda from 1999 to 2002, the sample size was quite low, but we can all nonetheless infer a lot from the study, as I will demonstrate. Now, during the time of this study, there was a prolonged drought. It's a seasonal rainfall pattern, and when the dry season is dry, it is very dry indeed. And this is a view of the study area, with the Chulu Hills in the background, and baobab trees scattered throughout the landscape, and individual farms of varying size, and patches of green where the river, uh, local rivers and streams flow. This is a map of the study area. And you can see there's a river and then houses dotted around some proximal to the river, some further away. And understanding the microspatial uh, epidemiology and ecology of these infections can help us understand what might happen during environmental change at a local level. Schistosomiasis is typically a focal disease, which means that it may appear in one area, but not another a few kilometers away. This is an attempt to show the spatial distribution of egg counts, fecal egg counts associated with Mansoni infection uh, before praziquantel treatment was administered. And the darker coloured circles correspond to uh, areas or neighbourhoods where there was a relatively high level of infection, and the light coloured circles correspond to households and neighbourhoods where there was relatively low levels of infection. What I want you to concentrate on is the fact that there appears to be some clustering of infections in one particular area, but there are infections all across the study area, uh, pre-treatment. Post-treatment, there was very little infection. This time, the colours are sort of beige brown, dark brown corresponds to relatively high levels of reinfection, but overall, the egg counts were remarkably low, again, against expectations, lower than expected uh, in this area. The reason for this differential reinfection rate is partly related to the topology of the river, which for nine months of any year is running dry, apart from a few areas where there is surface water, and they tend to be upstream here, this area here. As you move further downstream, then the river runs underground, and this is a well dug into the water table underneath, protected by acacia thorns, where people can gather, uh, take water. At this end of the river, uh, the stream, there is surface water available even during a drought period. But what did happen during this period is that the amount of surface water decreased massively, and that had an effect on the snails who may have estivated or otherwise died out because the habitat became unsuitable as a result of the, of the drought. So what we can conclude from this study is that the prolonged drought in this time was associated with low reinfection levels after praziquantel treatment. But perhaps more importantly, 
is that by looking at the spatial data, it suggests that the transmission area reduced considerably during the drought period. There was spatial clustering before praziquantel treatment. After praziquantel treatment, the focal area reduced in size. And this is perhaps what may happen during drought periods, that the uh, had it habitat any distance away from the main source of water, whether it be a pond or whether it may be a seasonal stream, will reduce considerably. And so the infection becomes more concentrated in smaller and smaller areas and people associated with that area are more likely to be exposed than others. The final example I want to show you about stories from the past is El Nino. El Nino is a phenomenon that is associated with increased temperatures in the Pacific that then have devastating effects sometimes across the world in terms of extreme weather events. In 1997, and this is uh, just some text on Wikipedia, it was estimated to cause 16% of the world's reef systems to die and temporarily warmed air temperatures by 1.5 degrees C compared to the usual increase of 0.25 degrees C associated with El Nino events. So it was quite a severe system. And there was some work under being undertaken in Kenya at that time. So again, coincident with an extreme weather event, we can understand how that might impact on attempts to intervene and eliminate an infection. This is the study area uh, halfway between Nairobi and Mombasa in Kenya. And there was in this uh, study, two communities, one that were subject to um, molluscicide to try and keep the snail numbers down over several years, and another where there was no molluscicide, but there was in both uh, communities treatment with praziquantel. Now, this uh, has been published in a paper uh, in, uh, by Curtis Kariuki and colleagues in Parasites and Vectors in 2013. This illustration is taken from that paper. Again, there was snail collection at a number of different sites, and this is the total number of snails here in the uh, intervention site from 1996 to 97 to 1998. And what you can see is that there were cytical population dynamics of the snails up until November, December of 1997, when there was a, what's been termed a freak storm in the area with extreme flooding, and the snails were essentially washed away. There were no more snails after that point. So the, there was clearly a population crash because there were no snails. And that lasted for several months, but only several months. And by 1998, the middle of 1998, the snails were coming back. So that's the important point here. The extreme weather event did destroy the snail population, but not completely because it emerged again several months later. This is a graph from the same paper showing what happened uh, to the two different sites. So there's the non-intervention site with no molluscosiding and the intervention site with molluscosiding and the period over which that molluscosiding occurred. So in the non-intervention site, there was again a population crash, but those snails bounced back considerably by 1999. So even the absence of muscosiding, in the absence of muscosiding, the uh, storm, the extreme weather event, reduced the snail population by about a year, and then it bounced back. In the intervention uh, site where there was muscosiding, the snail populations were suppressed for several years, but then started to re-emerge. At the same time, there was a downturn in the snail population of the non-intervention site. In terms of what happened to the population, the human populations in that time period, again, there were those that were, sorry, there were those that were in the community where there was molluscosiding and those who lived in the community without molluscosiding. The prevalence of infection is shown at the top over different surveys and the intensity of eggs, the number of eggs per gram of feces, this is again a Mantonine area, is shown on the bottom. Let's concentrate on the bottom graph. You can see that there, uh, at baseline, the levels of infection were higher in the non-intervention group than the intervention group. But over time, again, relatively low reinfection levels 
over a number of surveys. And then by about the early 2000s, the reinfection levels in the non-intervention group were increasing. In the intervention group where molluscociding was happening, the infection was suppressed as a result of killing snails. So no snails, no transmission. So what can we say in terms of the conclusions from this study? El Nino in 1997 did disrupt snail population dynamics, but for less than a year. It was a combination, however, of the molluscociding El Nino and chemotherapy with praziquantel that was associated mainly with low prevalence and intensity of infection in humans. So this is another example of how a dramatic climatic event associated that has been associated with climate change can help with elimination if it coincides with treatment. Now you may be thinking then that there is only one story to tell in essence that climate change is going to help elimination because the many the life sense the the snails that harbor schistosomiasis are sensitive to extreme weather and it's true they are very tightly grounded in particular locations because certain habitats have to be suitable the vegetation has to be suitable for those snails to thrive the temperature has to be suitable for those snails to thrive and if those environments change to become unfriendly to the um, to the um, snails then the snails will no longer be able to survive in those areas so we may well end up in the future with certain areas where there is no schistosomiasis as a result of extreme weather and if that coincides with attempts through uh, delivering medicines to eliminate the infection then we may find that some areas do uh, become areas unsuitable for the infection combined with treatment there is elimination however that's not the end of the story because we know that another effect of climate change is that habitats not only become unsuitable for snails, they become unsuitable for humans. And there are a, a, a number of stories associated with climate change refugees, as they are termed. And this is a graph that I published in a review uh, that's adapted from another paper uh, cited in the review that shows what happened recently in recent years in terms of migrations from Western Africa into other parts of the world. And these are migrations where the people who have migrated have said themselves that it's because of the climate reality, the climate crisis has forced them to migrate because their habitat has become unsuitable. Now there are schistosomiasis and other NTDs present in West Africa and individuals who migrate move because uh, they're forced to move because of the climate crisis may carry their parasites, the parasites they harbour, they may carry them with them into these new areas. Do we have any, any evidence that that is happening? Well, yes, we do, because there's been a number of reports in the literature in recent years of outbreaks on either previously uninhabited, uh, unaffected areas or where there's been a re-emergence in areas where elimination had been achieved. And this has happened in uh, Brazil, for example, in several places, but also in Corsica, in France, and there's been some discussion about it in the literature. So there's a number of published examples now of where there's been local outbreaks and some, for example, in Corsica, there's evidence of hybridization between the African form of the schistosome parasite and local cattle form, bovis. And so what we're looking at in the future is that in some areas, there may be reduced transmission because of extreme weather, but also possible translocation into new areas as a result, for example, of people moving uh, due to the climate crisis. Now, if we want to look into the future, we can do so but we have to think of a number of caveats. For example, uh, we can take experimental and field-based observations to model uh, the future, but those caveats mean that we have to make substantial assumptions 
and be very wary about making definitive conclusions. We can also investigate various scenarios uh, through the modeling process, but that again has to be, uh, you have to carry lots of assumptions with that. One of the value added points of modeling is that we can point to gaps in knowledge that need filling. So I've been involved in a number of studies that have investigated field aspects of schistomiasis transmission, but also supervised studies looking at modeling NTD transmission in relation to environmental change. And this is one of them. The work here was undertaken by a student, Nikki McCreish. He's now at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she developed a mathematical model, which is illustrated here, of the snail host in relation to infection with the parasite. And the data that supported this model was taken from experimental studies that she undertook, but also studies from the literature that suggested how long it takes for snails to develop and how they develop in the presence or absence of the parasite. So the input was a hypothetical myricidian infection and the output was a hypothetical saccharial infection. What Nikki was able to do in this, in this project was then vary the temperature by simulating the snail populations, changing the temperature that these simulated snails were subjected to and estimating how that would affect the output of saccharia. One of the outputs is illustrated on the right hand side of this slide. Uh, the relative hazard on the y-axis is a measure of um, the saccharial output in relative terms from zero to very, so we think of this as low to high risk and a simulated water temperature here for two different scenarios, a lake and a river. And the difference between these two scenarios is based on the energy expenditures of the uh, snails and how long they live for as a result. Now the solid line corresponds to a lake scenario and the dashed line corresponds to the river scenario. So these are modeling efforts under different, slightly different parameter settings, <coughs> excuse me. But what it shows is that the lake scenario, the infection in terms of hazard, the number of Sakari output peaks at a lower temperature than the uh, river scenario. Now, if we think back to the studies in Uganda in the lake setting, what might have happened there is that the snails actually experienced a reduction in temperature as a, as a result of the lake getting deeper, so the bottom of the lake got colder, and they may have moved further towards this temperature, which resulted in this very rapid crash in the snail population. What this also suggests is that we may need to consider differentially what happens in lakes as against rivers when we think about mitigation or adaptation. Now, Nikki's model was also able to look at what might happen across a wider area of Africa. This is the East Africa, in fact, and this was part of a, a large multidisciplinary study called Healthy Futures. You can read more about this project at www.healthyfutures.eu. And this is a, a spatio-temporal model that investigated how climate change scenarios corresponding to low, moderate or high warming may affect the transmission potential of schistosomiasis in these areas. It basically corresponds to habitat suitability for the snails. The uh, blue areas in, the, in these different maps correspond to low suitability and red and dark and into purple corresponds to levels of high suitability of the infection. So what you can see is that even under a low warming uh, scenario, which is what we hope for, there are some areas of East Africa that will be unsuitable for uh, transmission. Under uh, over 20 years, with a moderate or high warming scenario over 20 years, you can see that those areas do expand and become even less suitable, but mainly they become less suitable. So you can see that the area that is suitable for transmission doesn't change much, but some areas become more suitable or less suitable as a result. And over 50 years, we see particularly under the high warming scenario, so this might be RCP 8.5, for example, that the suitability of a large part of East Africa uh, reduces to zero and the area becomes, the area suitable for transmission reduces, but some parts of the 
uh, East Africa that are currently too cold may become suitably warm as a result. Now, this may correspond, for example, to areas of high altitude that are currently or have been historically too cold, becoming more suitable. Now, that's one study out of several that are now being conducted by investigators looking at climate change and schistosomiasis across the world. And this is a systematic review undertaken by Sophie Stensgard and colleagues, uh, published in 2018. And the studies that uh, I've been involved in uh, come from East Africa, but there's been a number of studies published in China that suggest that uh, climate change will have a, uh, a will increase transmission. That's what corresponds to red or positive here. In some areas, there is uncertainty, or it may have, or transmission may either reduce or increase, which is what we concluded from the work in East Africa. And some areas there are suggestions that climate change will decrease transmission. So we see that there is uh, no particular consensus on a global scale that country level studies suggest that the situation may change in different ways. And that points to some of the, A, the assumptions that are made and the caveats as well. But also we have to think that this is a fragmented situation and no one country is going to have a similar experience to another. So how can we summarize that all in one slide? So if we think about increased global temperature, those representation, those representative concentration pathways suggest that temperatures are going to rise, but we don't know by how much, then there may be a number of things that happen to either uh, increase or translocate transmission or decrease transmission. So in some cases, and this is extending now the discussion to multiple NTDs, habitat suitability may improve and the range expands. In other areas, the habitat suitability may decrease and the range contracts, leading to decreased transmission. Rainfall, something I've not had time to talk about here today, may uh, decrease and that may affect food and water security, forcing regional level migration, as we might have seen in the studies of climate refugees, uh, leading to a, a translocated transmission. On the other hand, mitigation adaptations may reduce frequency of contacts between humans, vectors and zoonotic hosts, uh, leading to decreased transmission. Uh, regional precipitation, extreme weather and flooding may lead to selection pressures, uh, which cause adaptation in the host life cycle, sorry, in the parasite life cycle, leading to increased transmission. Or, as we might have seen in uh, Uganda, asynchrony in the intermediate host and the environment leading to decreased transmission. So finally, I want to think about whether we should mitigate or adapt when we're thinking about planning how to reach elimination targets. Well, I think we first have to recognise that climate change requires both mitigation and adaptation. We can't, we can't just assume that everything is going to remain the same apart from the intervention. We do need to consider how we can mitigate and adapt those interventions in the face of a changing climate. When we think about mitigating, I think of it like this, it's about preventing infection ahead of likely or possible environmental change. And adaptation requires scaling up and flexibility of interventions to tackle outbreaks when they emerge. So on the one hand, we can plan through, for example, improving latrines and clearing areas that are suitable for habitation of the snails. And adapting means improve surveillance so that uh, outbreaks can be responded to more effectively. Uh, and the message from the research, I think, is that collection of environmental data during interventions can feed into both decision support tools, which I can talk about in the Q&A, uh, that help formulate policy and practice. So it is true, I think, what the WHO roadmap says, that climate change is going to affect the distribution of NTDs. I've shown schistosomiasis as an exemplar, but I think what I've said can be expanded to other NTDs, particularly those with an, uh, intermediate hosts or vectors. And there is a literature already about this on various infections. And in order to ask, answer the question, will it help or hinder elimination? I think 
the answer is it's complicated. And that's already recognized in the WHO document. But we need to drill down into that idea a bit, I think, and come up with some projects and particularly some research projects that can provide more data for modeling and improve models of how the future may shape transmission and then show those models, share those models with stakeholders who can then make decisions on whether to mitigate or adapt. So thank you very much for your attention. I will just point you to this article that is uh, that was published a couple of years ago and is now on open access. It's available through um, PubMed, uh, or I can share a link with you. In fact, I've uploaded the file to uh, webinar jam. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we, that, that was incredibly interesting. Uh, thank you for this overview of the very complex relationship between climate change and neglected tropical diseases. Um, you've shown us how acutely intricate those links are between environment and disease um, and remain affected by such a wide range of variables. You mentioned things like river topology, El Nino events, but also um, human migration, the concept of climate refugees and so forth. So uh, thank you very much for navigating all that for us. Um, we've had quite a few questions while you were giving your presentation. Um, they range from kind of very uh, specific ones about sales from the malacologists among us uh, to sort of wider policy uh, discussions and questions. So um, if, uh, if that's okay with you, we'll run through a few of those questions. Uh, we may not have time to answer and go through all of our attendees questions. So for those of you that I may miss, I just do apologize in advance, but Mark uh, obviously shared his contact details right at the start. And so I would encourage everybody to absolutely uh, get in touch. And um, if you do go on the chat function, um, you'll see Anu Guvras from the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance has very kindly shared a link to your paper, Mark. Uh, and also, I'll just post that in a few moments, but um, Mark Booth also very kindly gave a talk at one of our ICENTV conferences about the relationship between uh, climate change and waterborne tropical diseases. Um, so something to, to, to resources there to, uh, to discover further. Um, so first and foremost, we'll have a question here from uh, Onwuka Chigozi Devine, and this is looking at the disruption in snail population dynamics. A few questions about that. So, uh, what do you feel, Mark, would be some of the main reasons be behind the reduction in transmission during droughts? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for that question, Onwuka. I think one of the things that may happen is that the snails estivate. So, it's a form of hibernation. So, their metabolism changes and they don't need feed or they certainly uh, reduce their metabolism and then they emerge when the water comes back that's clearly one way in which the snails themselves can survive drought because we have to recognize that drought is not a new phenomenon it's it's ongoing the seasonal stream in kenya experiences nine months of dryness every year and yet the snails are there so they must have found a way themselves to adapt. And though we know from other ecological studies that organisms, particularly those that cannot regulate their own body temperature and are stuck in one location, have found ways to adapt to changing environmental conditions. So the uh, reduction in transmission is probably because the snails themselves are not present where people practice uh, open defecation or urination because that's what, how the transmission cycle continues in areas uh, that we've studied. It's through the contamination of the water bodies with uh, either feces or urine, depending on the species of schistosome, into the water, and that creates, the, that continues the life cycle if the snails are there. Oh, brilliant, thank you. And um, kind of uh, in, in the same uh, line here, a question from Fiona Allen from the Natural History Museum. Uh, Mark, what do you think the impact of the recent heavy rains in East Africa over the past year may be on snails and schistosomiasis? Thank you, Fiona. Yes, a <laughs> tricky question. I think that uh, I, I, I suspect that 
there's been a combination of effects. So some areas that were very wet will have become wetter. And as a result, the, the snails will have, been tran will have been moved around and translocated. Uh, but in some areas, there will have been extreme flooding, as we saw in Malawi, for example. And probably the snails are being moved away from their habitat. They're tied to specific habitats where there's vegetation. In the absence of the correct vegetation, the snails can't feed. Uh, and I think what what will the result will be is that the distribution of schistosomiasis has become more fragmented because the snails will some of those snails will have been translocated as a result of being swept away and then they establish in other areas. But I couldn't give a more precise uh, answer than that, I'm afraid. Mm. And uh, Fiona was uh, apologising for the question, so <laughs> saying sorry. <laughs> um, meanwhile, we've had lots of our attendees saying a very big thank you to you, Mark. Uh, Misule, thank you, Mark. Very interesting presentation. Uh, Semu Aditunji Adeniyi was saying many thanks for the uh, and many, many more from around the world. Um, so thank you, Mark, for all this food for thought. Um, a couple questions came in about um, the research itself. Um, so Juliet Chami was asking, to what extent have you investigated how changing water levels alter human behavior and preferred water contact patterns? Um, is this a gap still that remains in the research? Is it something you'd be looking at? That is a gap. Yes, I haven't uh, looked at that aspect, but it's quite possible that changing water levels would change behavior. So for example, we know that there are sites uh, in communities where specific actions are undertaken. That might be laundry in the uh, by the water's edge, or it may be recreation, or it may be that some people prefer certain areas to undergo uh, to do their toileting. Uh, and if those areas disappear as a result of localized flooding, then people will go somewhere else to do it, you know, that's private, for example, or they will have to do their laundry somewhere else. So it's inevitable, I think, that if the water, imagine a lake, if the lake shore changes as a result of uh, local uh, changes in the in the water levels, people will move there. They'll move back. You know, if, if the if the lake level increases, they have to move back, and areas where they used to go will no longer exist. So they they'll have to move, and I think that is certainly a gap in knowledge. Uh, we need to do some within community studies. A lot of the work that uh, is, is required about schistosomiasis has to be localized because it's such a focal infection. It's very difficult to generalize because the environment in which the snails thrive is often quite small and it, it relies on exploiting natural human behaviors in the same area. And if there's asynchrony between human behavior and the presence of snails, the, the transmission is interrupted. Absolutely, that's a very good point. Um, and Emily Negetic, and please uh, don't forget to tell us where you're tuning in from, uh, what your institution is. It's always really interesting to hear that, which country. But Emily was asking, um, how long does a study need to take for a researcher to exactly determine the effects of environmental changes on parameters of a parasitic disease or agent? Um, okay, so... Scales? Are we looking at? So you saw from the slides that I presented that these studies took several years and the value of working in one particular uh, community for several years is that you can go through several cycles, seasonal cycles, and understand the difference between very short term changes in environmental parameters and medium to longer term changes. Over the short term, you can gather some information to suggest what might be happening uh, across a range of environmental situations at that particular time, comparing a dry area with a wet area near a lake, further away from a lake, for example, and those kind of studies have been undertaken. They're more cross-sectional, but the really valuable studies are those that take in time as a very important variable and also space. So you get spatial temporal variation, and that allows you to delve more deeply into some of the factors that might result in changes in transmission in specific locations. It's a, there are many interactions that might occur between human behavior, the environment and the snails, and even things like predators of the snails. These snails are predated on the part of an ecological system, a food system. So there will be fish that predate on the snails, there'll be birds that predate on the fish, and they're all going to be differentially affected 
by climate. So think about bird migration. Bird migration patterns where birds uh, settle or rest in a particular area and they eat the whatever's available there and move on. Well, if those migrations are no longer happening, it may mean that some organisms that are um, carrying infection may be allowed to thrive. That's really interesting, Mark. And um, Stephen Bremer was, um, you yourself mentioned the extreme localization of schisto and infections. And Stephen Bremer was wondering, um, uh, did the mathematical models predict the disparity in reinfection rates that were observed in different localities that were very close? Is that something you've looked at? I was trying to think, the, can I have a look at, who was it? Uh, yeah, sure. It's um, one of the questions sort of right towards the start. I'll try and beam it up on your screen. Hopefully that's come through. Did mathematical models predict the disparity in reinfection rates in localities that were very close? Uh, as I suggested, the, the traditional mathematical models did not uh, explain the disparities because typically reinfection would occur rapidly in a high transmission area. Praziquantel is not a vaccine. It, re it removes the adult, the, the adult schistosome worms, but does not affect the environment in and of itself. So if the environment doesn't change, the snails are still there. If people's habits don't change, then they're still practicing open defecation. Then infection should, re uh, should uh, rise rapidly. What was different in this setting, as opposed to other studies that have been undertaken by the same team in different areas, was that reinfection did not occur to the same extent as was expected by either the mathematical models or previous observations. So that was the disparity. Uh, the Bogoigo situation that I mentioned, where reinfection levels were very high, also seemed to suggest that uh, there was a different mix of snail species, again, differentially affected. So the, the models themselves couldn't. And what we tried to capture in the climate change models is something around how temperature might be a very important variable, but we know it's not the only variable. Uh, and again, a gap in knowledge is, is, is understanding the other variables that might be important in determining future transmission. Mm. Fantastic. And uh, Mark, moving on a, a bit to the broader policy uh, kind of framework, uh, Eli Velton Fonseca is saying hello from Brazil, and Eli Velton's asking, how can climate change be included in public health decision making and policies at a local level? Mm -hmm. uh, Eli Velton is specifically working with visceral leishmaniasis in Sao Paulo, Brazil, mm -hmm. and is trying to develop a surveillance and response system at a community level. So, is it not working in Shisto? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so this is not, thank you for broadening How can out we the, bring the this. Uh, <laughs> um, I think there is a lot to be done in terms of improving local capacity for surveillance in particular. Now, I've written another paper that looks at how we might need to establish surveillance systems that look across a range of uh, tipping points. Oh, my uh, video has gone off. That's OK. okay. Sometimes um, the me. bandwidth uh, just does that automatically. Okay. You'll, you'll be back. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think uh, what we can think about in terms of the wider policy is how the rather high level statements of the World Health Organization, such as former partnership, can actually be translated into implementing that partnership. How, what do they need to what needs to be done at a very local level? I think there's room for public health champions who are specialists to some degree in particular public health issues to uh, work at the local level. They need to understand the ecology, some of the biology and some of the social aspects of transmission. In other words, have a, a more holistic view perhaps of the life cycle. And they need to observe local events and have sufficient knowledge about transmission and biology, that they can take that information and take it to the policymakers and say, we, this is what's happening in our local area. There's At the moment, I think there isn't sufficient uh, critical numbers of public health specialists in areas that need them. Um, and if they grow in numbers, if we can have cohorts that are trained in parasitology, which I happen to teach, and uh, if, if they... <laughs> 
if they if they're trained up and they are deployed in areas that are either thought to be at risk or know to be at risk then they can provide that information it's about information gathering fantastic um and broadening again the discussion to other diseases uh, our friend and colleague Madi Borhani is asking um how can does climate change impact and increase or decrease cystic echinococcosis and in case um you know um you don't know or these are massive gaps what might what steps might researchers in this field uh, start to look at or what should they do first to start to address these issues okay so first of all i'd like to point the questioner to the article uh, published in 2018 where i did review uh echinococcus alongside 30 other uh, parasites. I can't actually recall exactly in my head right at this moment what I wrote about it, but the information is certainly there. Uh, more broadly, I can say that with all NTDs, including echinococcus, there is a risk that the interaction between wildlife and uh, domesticated animals is p potentially profound because wildlife is under a lot of pressure from anthropogenic influences, habitat destruction, deforestation, etc. We know uh, bird migration is going to change, but also the migration of uh, rodents uh, that carry uh, certain types of uh, foodborne trematodes, uh, sheep, wild population of sheep, wild dogs, all these zoonotic uh, infections are possibly going to be susceptible to the indirect and direct effects of climate change. So. The parasites themselves, if they if they have a free living, sen uh, climate sensitive stage, an egg or a free living larval stage, then the soil or the water parameters, the the conditions in the soil and water, are going to have a profound effect on those free living stages. If they don't have a free living stage, they're passed di pass directly. So think of um, a filarial nematode in a mosquito, for example. It's passed directly from the mosquito to the uh, host then it's the mosquito that we need to think about rather than the parasite. Uh, and so there's going to be for all nature, all different types of NTDs, a knowledge of the life cycle is vitally important. And then understanding for each of the climate sensitive stages, how environments affect the survival of those stages is going to be important. So understanding the life cycle first, and then understanding how the environment affects those life cycles and then looking at the potential reservoirs, the zoonotic reservoirs, but also the domestic reservoirs and how they may be indirectly affected. It might be because certain areas become less suitable for grazing. Imagine that for sheep. So those sheep are moved uh, and the whole uh, life cycle is then translocated somewhere else. There's many possible ways to look at this. So the complexity is the key here. Yeah. 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 It has, it, it, I, I'm trying to avoid saying it's complicated, but it is. It is, absolutely. Well, you've really helped us to navigate uh, that complex landscape. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. Um, Ellie Belton Fonseca was saying many thanks for your answer. Sorry not to have written a question about Shisto, but excellent talk. Um, Bonnie Webster from Natural History Museum London saying thanks for lots of very valuable information. Uh, Deborah Adipoju, thank you, Mark, for the presentation and, and many, many uh, more thanks. I think it was particularly appropriate that we kind of ended talking on about zoonoses uh, because Monday, July the 6th will be World Zoonoses Day. For us today, uh, I think our time has come uh, up to an end for this webinar. So it's a very big thank you, Mark, for, for your time today. And thank you to all our attendees for tuning in.